it's a great pleasure to, 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 to be here. Um, I think it's particularly appropriate because this, these events were the first 50 years ago. The British actually left uh, South Yemen on the 30th of November 1967, the day that the People's Republic of South Yemen uh, was, was formed. Um, there's been a lot written about the 1960s in, in, in Yemen, um, but I, I wanted to talk more particularly about uh, the NLF, the, the sort of British enemy at the time, how they uh, approached this and how they uh, viewed it. Um, this was done originally as an article in, um, from Middle East Studies, which is uh, this is the latest issue of Middle East Studies, which is entirely devoted to Yemen in the 1960s, looking at both the Federation of South Arabia, what was going on in Yemen. There's a very good piece by Stephen Day on what it was like to be a political officer in, uh, in Abyan, um, and also trying to compare what was going on, what happened in, in South Yemen, what later happened in the UAE, where the Federation sort of worked. It didn't in, in the South. But uh, for some, to, really, to begin this, I think we have to go back to the world of the um, 1950s, 1960s, particularly the uh, that the revolution of, from 1952 in Egypt, uh, which led this great surge of Arab nationalism, which affected the, the entire region, um, uh, particularly young people. I, I experienced it myself in Kuwait and um, uh, Libya and East Jerusalem at, at this time. And it, it, it was a transformational event, which is it's difficult to, to perhaps see it now, but at the time it, 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 it was enormous. And it affected. Um, South Yemen, South Arabia, where the British were, and Aden, um, very much, particularly in, in, in Aden itself. Uh, that, was, that, was, that was part of the background. So you have this resurgence of, re emerge, emergence of Arab nationalism at the same time as uh, Britain, which had been in, uh, in South Arabia since the, um, well, see, in Aden at least since 1839, was readjusting um, to, to its post war uh, resources and the reality. Of, of uh, decolonization uh, and um, uh, a, a reduced role in the world, uh, particularly highlighted by the fact that for most of this period up to 1964, there had been a conservative government which, which was perhaps clinging more to the past, replaced in the middle of all this by a Labour government in, in 1964, which uh, would sort to adjust much more to the, uh, uh, what they saw as the realities of the time. Um, the British interest in, in, in South Arabia was primarily Aden. Uh, this, this is a picture of Aden, actually, from 1519, a picture of Droid. That's, that's the Portuguese fleet in the, in the harbour. Um, um, but uh, it's there to emphasise the fact that the use of port that was important. Uh, when uh, the British entered uh, uh, Aden in 1839, it was the Bombay Marine uh, from, coming from, from East Indian. From India, and uh, for much of the period, uh, uh, South Yemen, South Arabia was run from, from India. And it was the Indian uh, policies that affected um, uh, South Arabia, particularly came in the initial stages to looking at how to manage the many emirates and sultanates and tribes and sheikhdoms that, that were there. There was an assumption that, like Egyptian rulers, that they were, they were rulers. But in fact, most sheikhs, emirs, and sultans in, 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 in Yemen were really. Mediators uh, had a great difficulty often controlling uh, the, the tribes uh, beneath them. Um, beyond Aden was the, uh, um, the, the Aden Protectorates, the West Aden Protectorate, which is the one on the top. As you can see, with each of those names there is a, is a sultanate or a sheikhdom or an emirate. Um, Divided like that, uh, the border itself um, was was uh, um, the result of negotiation between the Ottomans and the British uh, in 1904, when both were expanding from their, their strongholds in the south. But, but with the British centre in, in a the, the protectorate was there to intend to protect a, um, and it was a very reluctantly uh, moved into signing protectorate agreements with. The, the tribes in this area to try and uh, to try and to protect uh, Aden from the um, uh, Imam of Yemen's uh, incursions into the uh, in, into the south uh, uh, and the Ottomans at the time. To the eastern side, the rest of what was then South Arabia, the, the eastern Aden protectorate, uh, was uh, was acquired much later than, than this, and it's rather different. They were more sophisticated. Uh, 
uh, sultanates there, the Kaiti, Mahra, well, not Mahra, it's just again, but Kaiti and, and Kasiri. Uh, so you have the two protectorates, but beyond uh, Aden. Beyond Aden in 1960, again, this needs to be recorded, it's the second busiest port in the world, the fourth largest, you know, depending on uh, like Dubai, perhaps, is today. It's difficult to, to, to imagine this now. And from 1958, the, the British Middle East Command was moved to Aden with more than 15,000 troops. Um, but the population of Aden itself, um, which has expanded greatly uh, post-war, was, but by the time we're talking about the 1960s, the majority of the people in it were either from North Yemen or from the protectorates. They were the original Aden's or the people the British had brought in. Uh, there were political exiles from the North there. And the impact of Suez of 1956, colonial disengagement, the Third World, the UN, and the nationalism of the time was uh, uh, deeply affected the politics of, of, of Aden. There was a move within Aden for Aden, for Aden but, but that was rather overwhelmed by the dyna dynamic political atmosphere created by Arab nationalism and the many active clubs there that were really fronts for political activity. <coughs> Very active trade union uh, 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 unions at the time linked to the British TUC, the, the strong links between the two. Uh, from the fifth, late 50s onwards, the Aden politics tended to be Protests, demonstrations, strikes, and countermeasures. It was a, 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 a difficult, a difficult time. Um, that that picture could, I think, been taken any time from 1958 onwards. I don't actually know when it was, what, what date it was, but it's just to give a, a, a feel of what it was like at the time. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that the the Indian influence uh, in, in the West. This is a, a picture on the. Um, the oh. This is a uh, this is the Durbar in I think uh, for Edward the Edward Seventh uh, <coughs> Edward Seventh was uh, the Sultan of Qaisi uh, attending and this was a uh, uh, one of the West uh, uh, I think that's the Sultan of of, of Abdali visiting uh, um, uh in uh, um, uh, in this period that gives to show the flavour of the Indian uh, atmosphere. Uh, the, the protectorate agreements that were signed with the, with the tribes continued on, continued going on. This is actually the, the last one that was actually signed in 1954, um, only a few years before we're talking about, uh, with the, uh, a tribe in the Upper Yafai, the, uh, uh, the, the Usi. Um, and you can see it really is the language of the past at the top of this final paragraph, um, where the sheikh is required to keep the roots open in, in exchange for uh, uh, annual payments. But the idea really with these protective agreements was, was that the, um, the, the British would support the, the Sheikh wherever it was, provide arms, and he would keep the, uh, the enemies of, of the UK out. It was only much later on, from about the 1940s onwards, that um, uh, they start, the British began to sign advisory agreements, which, was, which did lead to an injection of cash. Uh, and advice on how to, how to help some of these governments to develop their internal institutions, which one governor called it idealism with cash, um, but uh, I think it was Humphrey Trebellion who called it cynicism with economy. It was done on the cheap, uh, very, very little money uh, uh, put into it. If you look at the Aiden Handbook in, in 1960, this is an assessment of the tribes at the time we were talking about, of their loyalty uh, and development to the UK. And you can see those at the, towards the top, close to Aden, those who stable, socially advanced, some as cooperate with others, but the further down you go, uh, wild tribal areas. This is actually not, not administered by the British or anybody else. Uh, and these are dubious uh, loyalty. Now, the significance of this is the British were trying to protect Aden. Uh, from the top downwards, whilst the NLF, when they looked at this, started working from the top up. You go for the areas of dubious loyalty and then try and build your support uh, uh, within it. The South Arabian Federation was an attempt, uh, as the British were, were beginning to think about leaving in, in the, in the, in the, in the 
from the mid-1950s onwards to create a, uh, a federation a, a system that, that would survive and enable the British uh, presence to, to, to survive. And the idea was to link the various sheikdoms and tribes, emirates, link them to Aden and, and leave a coherent uh, system behind it. But, but uh, it obviously, there were so many flaws in that, mostly because there's, because there's a great disparity between the development of Aden, which had money and development from major court and the, uh, and the lack of development in some, some of the uh, uh, tribal areas. But you see from some statements, of the first three or four statements there, that the objective was that Aden was to be kept, that was the point, um, and everything else was to be done to protect and to maintain uh, Aden. Um, um, the eastern part, the, the, the eastern uh, uh, never became part of this federation. It was plagued by weaknesses and undermined by British policies, which I'll say a bit about in a minute. But one of the important things was the creation of the federal, uh, federal regular army from the expanded protected levies and other units. And that was a success. There was a coherent uh, army, eventually became the South Arabian army, which actually was inherited. Uh, by, um, by, by the PWI afterwards, although they, they, just, they, they destroyed it, but it was, a, a, it was one of the few uh, federal uh, uh, um, systems that, uh, that, that, that um, was enduring. Apart from uh, the, I'm just going to make a point here, the administration. Ali Nasser Mohammed was one of the leaders of the NLF, who was Prime Minister when I was there in the 1970s. He told me that the great legacy you gave to us was your administration, because we found us we had all the laws, and all we could do was sit in Aden and we could administer the country the way you had never done. Part because you weren't ruthless enough, was, was what, he, what he added. Um, um, and this is how the NLF were, and saw British policies in the, the protectorates. They thought that the British were undermining the rulers by the way they were appointing. They saw the appointment of political advisers as undermining the authority of the rulers, whilst we saw it as helping them to develop. Um, Air power should be used to sort of, uh, um, sort of thin, thin uh, British presence to deal with cultural tribes was seen also as undermining rulers, uh, and were, as well as the employment of professional guards rather than tribal, tribal levies to protect uh, the, the rulers, uh, collecting the, 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 the taxes and lotels which had formerly been uh, part of the uh, um, share of the tribes, um, and then acquiring land. Uh, and so that the NLF could see, this, this saw that this was, this was very much weakening, um, and assessed that, uh, that this, this provided them with an opportunity. Uh, just, just before I go any further, just to see some, some key dates uh, here, um, because these, these very much affect what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, the expansion of the military base, I've made, the Federation of Arab Emirates, which was the step towards becoming the South Arabian Federation. The, the, the overthrow of the Imam of Yemen in, in, in 1962 was a major event because it, it did transform the political situation. Um, but then Aden joined the Federation in 1963. The Federation was becoming independent by 1969 with a defence treaty and the British base retained. Um, then they then really go to, going down to um, October 1964, the Labour Party would win the election. Britain to go in 1968 but retain the Basin Treaty. Two years later, February 1966, Britain decides to leave in 1968 without a base or without a treaty. Uh, the significance of that really, uh, that really told everybody uh, that uh, whoever was going to rule South Arabia after them, they would have to, in effect, compete for it amongst themselves. Uh, the British left uh, in uh, November 1967. The, the, before the, the politics in Aden was dominated at the time uh, by, by the, by the um, People's Socialist Party, which I'm sorry about all these initials, but uh, I've tried to reduce them here. But uh, it's rather, South Yemen is rather full of initials. What became Flossy, known as Flossy, which was the main rival to the NLF in the run up to, to independence. It started with the People's Socialist Party. That's a, a photograph of uh, Abdullah Asmaj, um, who was the founder of it, uh, who died in 2014. I was able to talk to, talk to him quite a lot about this um, uh, before he died. Um, but he talked, uh, you know, this, 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 in, in, in the 1960s, this emerged from the trade union movement. It was a really well-organized party. Um, 
but very much based in Aden only, um, uh, using political agitation, uh, strikes, demonstrations, seeking to uh, organise for, for elections, uh, linking up with uh, other uh, political parties, strongly backed by, by Egypt at the time, uh, recruiting mainly amongst the, 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 the um, uh, non asian um, uh, protectorate workers, although there were some Aden's in it. Um, but it, 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 despite its, its great strength in Aden uh, 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 and its commitment to, to, to a political struggle, it didn't at this stage at least advocate violence. It was saw its uh, seeking independence through politics. Um, it, it failed to uh, uh, extend itself outside Aden. Um, and it's really too close to Nasser, particularly towards the end. And too many decisions were referred to Nasser. But Laszlo told me how he felt that he had to refer to Nasser before, for, for example, responding to a British invitation to negotiate with, the, um, with them in 1968. Okay. Um, I, but the South, South Arabia League, was, 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 which, which became part of Flossy later, was a different party. It was established earlier, but it actually did have a, a base outside uh, uh, Aden and did see itself as a, as a, um, uh, a federation wide party, but it, it never it fully established itself. And all these organisations were merged upon Flossy in, in, from 1966. The movement of Arab nationalists, which is the, uh, well, these were the creators of the NLF. Um, this was a, um, one of the several uh, nationalist movements that emerged in the, you know, the, in the 1950s. In this one, particularly influenced by events in Palestine, the tragedy of 1948, as they saw it. Um, um, Central American University of Beirut, but many uh, uh, of the South Yemeni and Yemeni members were recruited in, in, in Cairo in the, in the 1950s. Funny enough, when I was doing my PhD in Libya, I met people who'd been in Cairo, Libyans who'd been in Cairo with the South Yemenis, but had been recruited by the Ba'ath Party. But for some reason, the, uh, the um, man, as it was called, was, was particularly successful with, 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 with the Yemenis. Um, and also in the diaspora, some of the leading figures in the NLF came from uh, the um, uh, community in, in, in Kuwait, Ali Antar, who was the leader of the um, um, uh, of Radfan, I think originally was, was from there, um, recruited there, and, and, and others, so being from Bahra there. Um, but they saw, the, 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 that, that's the, this photograph there is of the leaders of the, of the man with the NLF after independence. Um, uh, but, but they saw Yemen's the best chance of taking power in the uh, in, in Arab world. This is why they focused very much on helping Yemen, and they kept Kabi Bash, Yorkshire Bash, Bash Naif and Wagner, were constantly in, uh, in, in, in uh, I'll stand back a bit, yes, maybe better. Uh, but it seems, at that stage, it didn't have a very clear ideology. It really wanted to destroy what was existing and allow the Arab genius to, 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 uh, to, to emerge and create something new. Um, um, but it, it, it moved in a more Marxist direction uh, later on. Uh, but, but the real point about it was it's highly secretive. Excellent operational security and internal discipline. Very much top down. But the, the motto was execute, they discuss. Um, and it had a cell system uh, which built up in, 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 in Aden through the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, penetrating many aspects of, uh, of the um, uh, of the federal government, um, the, the refinery, was, the, 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 the Fatah Ismail, one of the leaders, the fact that he was the main fighting Aden, was actually uh, was a, a, an apprentice at the BP refinery in Aden. Uh, they cooperated with the communists and, and Ba'athists, uh, which later became part of the NLF, but uh, it had around about 500 members at the, uh, at the, at the time of 1950. Uh, and this was his view written, say, before any of the events I'm talking about. So it was written by Abdel Fattah Ismail, the leader, in 1958. And you can see from here what he, what he wanted from the very beginning. Focus on the armed struggle. Now, the, you call it the armed struggle or terrorism, which, you know, which side you're, 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 is, is affected. But it was that from single-minded focus on the armed struggle, the British had to be thrown out by, or forced out by, by arms, um, as did the enemies. 
But nothing could happen until there'd been a revolution in the North. They had to stood this. They needed a safe base to which to operate, so they could train and uh, prepare. Um, but they, but the, the, their fundamental strategy was to mobilise the hint, hinterland and attack Aden from attack Aden from the hinterland. Whilst the British the whole British position was based on on protecting Aden from the hinterland. It was the, the uh, they saw that protectorate as a as a shield to Aden, whilst the NLF saw it as its Achilles heel. Um, this is a photograph of, um, of, of this one here, Abdel Nasser, with Khartan um, uh, Shahi, who was the leader of the uh, um, NLF at this time, the first president of, uh, of uh, independent South Yemen, on, on the right, with, with um, Salah, who was the leader of the coup in, in Yemen in, in 1962. But, but Nasserism was, uh, and Abdul Nasser's personality loomed over all this. The, but the NLF really had the most extraordinary luck with timing. I mean, they were well organized, they were secretive, they, uh, they were fo focused on the armed struggle. But everything then fell into place for them. The, uh, the imam was overthrown. Therefore, you know, the safe bait was classically what you need for a guerrilla war. Um, Egyptians support uh, uh, from, from the very beginning um, for the revolution in the north. And eventually, some 60,000 British troops, Egyptian troops, were sent to, to Yemen to fight, fight the war uh, about, about 1965. Um, um, the NLF itself was formed in, uh, in um, between, between May and September. There's several meetings, February to September 1963. But ten organisations, but essentially it was organised by the, uh, the movement of Arab nationals. They um, uh, they dominated the organisations that, that have to, uh, people, uh, anyone was welcome to join a revolutionist, but you'd have to accept a man leadership, discipline, and uh, policies. But it had around 1, 1,500 members when it started. Um, the PSP Abdul Nasser refused to join. They decided they wanted to continue with the political struggle, not the armed struggle. But it was but it was the bases, officers, and, and support in, in Yemen. And, and the what is the unknown fact of all this is how much support the Egyptian gave them. It's the it's one thing you can't look in the archives because it was largely organised by the Egyptian intelligence service, which don't open their archives. Um, but it's very clear it was massive effort at the beginning. A number of training bases set up in the north. People were sent sent, sent to Cairo. But British um, and the British tended to assume it was all Egyptian. As I was showing they didn't realise how important the other NLF was. It, it, it was. it was everything was seen as coming from Egypt. Whilst the NLF itself saying, oh well we had some Egyptian support at the beginning, but we didn't really need them after after that. So this is the so there's three different narratives and the truth isn't quite uh, it's, isn't quite clear. But it had strong political backing from Cairo, um, but Egypt also backed the uh, the PSP and Flossy in in, in a, to both horses. But Dal Lasnaj said that they, he thought they were playing with both horses at the same time. They didn't matter who won, so it was one of them won. Um, and the people, Yemen, and, Yemen and Arab Republic much preferred uh, uh, Flossie uh, uh, PSOB to the NLF, uh, but, but they saw the value of the uh, NLF in keeping British tied down in, in South Yemen because at the time the British were clearly giving covert, covert uh, to the royalists in the, in the north. So there was this, underground war going on. Um, it began, the, the, the revolution began in Radfan on uh, uh, 14th October 1963. It's not clear, not even clear to me today, whether the NLF initiated this or whether or simply took advantage of it. Um, but it really goes back to the problem I mentioned, the Emir of Dala trying to control his tribes. His tribes simply didn't recognise his authority, the Qutaybi and the other Radfani tribes. Um, and that was the core of the problem. Uh, many of the Qutaymi and Radfanis went north to help defend the revolution in, uh, uh, in Sana'a. Um, um, when they came back with their arms, uh, they resisted attempts to, um, to force them to hand over an arms. They ambushed a military patrol, which kicked off uh, a, a, a series of events, which eventually led to a significant uh, operation lasting several months, uh, requiring British Army and even deployed special forces in the end to, to put it down, which it was done. It was put down successfully and followed up, in fact, by an admiral uh, um, development program. Um, um, but 
what it what it showed, uh, and then, yes, I've just made, they, the red balls were yellow, that's what they became romanticized of the, 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 the later on. Um, but what it, this, the NLF concluded, this from their own writings, this is what they say they concluded at least, uh, from what happened in Grand Fire, where they, they had been beaten, but they had won as far as they were concerned, because they could see, they'd do the lessons as the British would fight forever in the protectorates for rain. That wasn't, you know, the important point was aim, you have to focus on aim. But the deployment of relatively few uh, NLF forces could, could uh, engage uh, a significant se security force from the other side to um, uh, deal with it. Therefore, the, the, the strategy should be to open as many fronts as possible, have as many uh, operations uh, in different parts of the uh, area, coming, mostly coming from over the border, uh, trained by the Egyptians, coming over the border uh, and hitting hit and run operations, 13,772 in 1965, for example, in the upcountry areas. Many of these are small, just tossing a hand grenade, but others were, were much bigger. Um, but so by 1965, there were over 12 of these uh, fronts, as they, as they call them. And it was at this stage, in 1965, the NLF, at a conference held in, uh, in, in, in Yemen, um, to which many people from the South went and attended, um, reorganized the organize themselves and start uh, uh, um, moving from a re more of a tribal uh, um, war to try to organize a, what they call the, uh, the um, a revolutionary army, uh, which could operate in uh, liberation, <coughs> operating in up to 50, and could, which would come together, and creating of, um, a, which would try and take territory with revolutionary communities, who would then try and administer and hold that territory. Um, um, this also saw the move uh, f uh, towards a much more political approach, an ideological approach, with, with two effects. One is to organise, set up to organise itself much more in, in Aden, so we would have political work going alongside um, uh, guerrilla work. Um, um, but the, uh, there were also divisions of the leadership emerged from that between a right wing, which was looking much more internationally, and, and, the, and the people inside the country, the, the, the fighters. Uh, and that became significant uh, later. There was no split at the time, but it happened very soon after independence. Um, Mustin, that's the chap there, Mustin, who was a feared man in the early days of the uh, PDOI, he's still, still around. He lives in a house in Aiton and Thomas and myself called in there. Uh, he's written his biography, which I use quite a, uh, uh, quoting quite a bit of his biography in, in, in this. Um, um, he was the main, man, the, the, one of the main commanders in, uh, of the Fidaim in Aden. Um, the Fidaim were the, uh, the, the, the fighters, the street fighters, people fighting the British. Uh, the the NLF distinguished between the Fidaim and, and, and the people in political work. Um, but you can see from this that battle must be fought in Aden, no matter what the difficulties and losses. Uh, and that's the reasons he gave to show that Aden was vulnerable, just as vulnerable. Uh, uh, the, the arms provided them were. Better um, and to show that the NLF was the, was the leading uh, uh, revolution. And his tactics were to destroy a special branch, to destroy uh, the, the people trying to uh, uh, get intelligence on, 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 on them, uh, and penetrate the federal aid and the institutions, and terrorize and intimidate the British federal, federal rules and officials and win support that way. The actual Abdul Fattah Ismail was the actual overall commander in Aden and then later became president of, uh, of, of, of uh, South Yemen. Um, uh, his picture's there. So the arms struggle in the hands of Fidayim. Uh, and the Fidayim were kept separate from the, um, the political work. The leadership, the NLF leadership in, um, in, in Taiz was not aware of operations or indeed of the operatives um, uh, who were working in Aden very tight operational security. And they developed a whole network of to smuggle arms and provide support. In fact, they involved women from the very beginning. Women were taking part of not necessarily guerrilla fights, but all the support work. And that many of the, much of the arms sniping was actually done by, by, uh, by women. Um, um, and they set out to destroy the special parts, largely to assassinating the local um, Arab officers, which, which, which they did, more or less, uh, and some of the British intimidating reformers um, and then moving on from then to try and attack other centres 
that were created to uh, um, oppose them. The British responded by, by um, uh, uh, organising um, uh, protection uh, in Aden, but the, the problem throughout all this was a lack of intelligence on, on the NLF. Um, and, and they, uh, nobody really knew on the British side how strong the NLF were, how numerous they were, uh, um, how effective they were. Um, it began uh, with high, uh, high permanent attacks against the gap. The first was actually in 1963, another senior figures. Um, um, but the political organisation, this is where they, start, they set out to try and penetrate the, the Federal Army. Both Flossy and NLF were recruiting inside the Federal Army, uh, seeking to, uh, they, they, they knew they could see its strength and they attacked on their side. Um, but also the NLF started penetrating the trade unions, which had been the st strength of uh, Flossie and, and Abdullah Asimash. And you, re reading their accounts and talking to ex NLF operatives, it, it was an al almost routine nature by, um, by operations in 1967. It's surprising, you know, they go to the same safe house, you get a gun, go and shoot somebody. Uh, it was, um, it's, um, it's extraordinary to, 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 to read about it to, to, to today, um, unless you're on the receiving end, of course. Um, I said the British underestimated the, the, the NLF. Um, it was only banned in 1965, um, it, and it was noted that the, uh, so the trade union side was just as active as the, uh, the, the militants. <laughs> and it was a force to recognise, reckon with. JIC is the Joint Intelligence Committee. These Joint Intelligence Committee uh, papers for this period are now available in the Public Records Office. And we can see from that that it was the assumption throughout all this, it was actually all the all the operations that were going on in Aden were coming from Egyptian intelligence, carried out by uh, uh, um, people working for the Egyptians. Um, you see, CIA concluded that the NLF was unlikely to take over. I suspect they're getting the information from the British. Um, although by 1967, the British knew quite a lot about the NLF, but they didn't really know enough about its power and structure. That quote at the end is actually from Oliver Miles, who was there in 1967 with uh, Humphrey Trevelyan. Um, when they're looking at whether they should go to with the NLF. You can see, as you said there, we knew about the NLF, but we knew nothing, almost nothing about it, which is really quite extraordinary. Uh, think, think that. It all seemed to be going well in, for, for the NLF in 1964 and 1965 when the Egyptians intervened, partly because there'd been a, uh, an agreement with King Faisal in Yemen. Uh, uh, to try and end the civil war there. The Egyptians really wanted to calm things down in the south. Um, but also they wanted to try and, um, they were determined to throw the British out. This is very much, Nasser said this um, uh, several times, even to people like Hasnaj. He, he talked of their determination to, to, and they would stay in the north until the British had gone from the south. So that was, that was their attitude at the time. But they tried to merge a, the, the, the flop of, PSP uh, and NLF to create a, uh, as they saw it, taking advantage of the uh, strength of the uh, NLF in Aden, and, uh, of, of the NLF and the protectors and Flossie in Aden, and also taking advantage of the political work of the uh, of, of PSP, Flossie, and the uh, armed struggle capabilities of the NLF. Um, and this was what led to the creation of Flossie. It was a merge between the two. Um, and they set and they created their own uh, 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 terrorist arms struggle network, PORF. I, I saw about another initial, the Popular Organisation for the Revolutionary Forces, it was called. It was, it was a Flossie army, uh, Flossie uh, gang of militants, around 1,500 to 1,700 of them in, in Aden in 1967, uh, about half the size of the NLF in Aden at the time. Um, um, but this forced merger, as the uh, NLF called it, call, was never accepted by, by much of the leadership. It was the external leadership, and part of the external leadership only, that signed it. And they were expelled, in fact, soon afterwards by, uh, by the NLF leadership. But, it, but it, particularly it was the people in Aden, the Fidayu in Aden, who were absolutely determined to destroy this um, uh, uh, merger. Uh, they could see how strong they were and how weak Flossie were. Uh, and they set out to do so in a, in a series of events, which I'm going to hear, but, in, but the, the effect was that in, at the end of 1966, um, 
uh, the two of Flossie uh, ceased, I mean, the, the merger ceased to exist. And what had happened was you had Paul Flossie and NLF uh, left as a, as a state, and the British were clearly going to go in the end of the year, and they fought each other four times in, in, in 1967, different, uh, increasing in, in, in intensity. The Egyptians cut off support they left, but that, by that time they left were too, they were too well organized. They were able to rob banks, extort money, tax people, acquire, acquire the resources they needed, and, and all the arms they needed. They didn't need the Egyptians at this stage. Um, and they operated independently without them. Although Asnash, uh, who was in Thais at the time talking to, to the Egyptians, thought that there was still some Egyptian support going to, to the NLF. Um, the, uh, the Flossie in particular was affected by the Egyptian defeat in the 1967 June War, when uh, which um, you know, led to the removal of Egyptian troops from, uh, from, from, from Yemen. Um, uh, just a brief word before I talk about the final year and Hadamat and Mahra. Um, this was a much lower priority to the NLF at the time. Was le less of a man and had much less penetration in Mokhala and uh, uh, Sayun. Um, um, and, the, and most of the work there was on political work. The, 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 the art struggle uh, didn't start until 1967. There were one or two instances before it, but it didn't really effectively go from 1967. And it required, in fact, the NLF to send some experienced uh, terrorists from Aden to, to, uh, to, help, uh, uh, to help lead it. Um, but it was a fairly, well, I wouldn't say peaceful, but it was a, a, a less violent a struggle there. In the end, the NLF were were strong enough to be able to in effect negotiate with the, uh, the, the, the administrations that were there because the sultans were out, out um, negotiating in Geneva to take advantage of their absence to, uh, to take over the country. And when the sultans came back by a boat to Makala, they were turned away, not just by the um, um, NLF, but by the Hadri Bedouin Legion, which was the, um, uh, the uh, sultan, which was the British force in the uh, in, in Hadramaut. Um, um, uh, and in, in fact, that was the end uh, of the um, of the Hadrians, as far as an independent power. And same in Mah Mahra. Mahra was taken over for the same year with some some uh, with some help from but the you know, left there. Now, the final year, at this by this stage, British were going. Um, Lord Sackleton was sent to assess. He, he apparently concluded that Fossey would lose, but and that led to the appointment of Humphrey uh, Trevelyan, Lord Trevelyan, as governor. Um, and whilst he was there, Stan Fall, who was uh, thinking my ambassador in Kuwait, laughed at this. Um, he um, he uh, had been sent to try and to, to contact the NLF. There was no contact at the time with the NLF at all. Uh, and he managed uh, through the uh, army to find uh, met two members of the NLF, uh, one of whom sounds, from the description, remarkably like Ali Sal al Beed, but I know. I can't confirm that. Uh, he didn't, no names were given, but it looked like him. Um, and, but he was told, and they were sort of saying, you know, we, we want to go, stop killing us, and you, we'll talk to you. But the NLF said, no, we're not interested. We've got to be seen to uh, drive you out for the armed struggle. Um, uh, and it's like, no, thank you. Um, the next significant effect was the, usually uh, in the, um, Armed police um, and the occupation of the crater. Uh, this, this happened in 1920 uh, 21 June uh, 1967. It was a significant event at the time, hugely significant event at the time. I'm not going to go into detail, but, um, the, 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 what was going on was that the, the armed forces of the police were being um, reorganised at the time. And the, the South Arabian army was being created, and various police and other units were being merged together. With some unhappiness within the um, uh, within the forces, the the, the um, South Arabian forces uh, about about the way this was to be done, but it seems to be essentially a series of misunderstandings that led to um, um, uh, a, a series of events, um, which if, which over a two or three day period led to the death of twenty two British soldiers that were killed by. Uh, the army either by the armed police or in Creighton, uh, where um, uh, a patrol of, um, uh, was, was ambushed from an armed police uh, barracks in, uh, in, 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 in Creighton.
crater. But it was a, a, a major event at the time, um, partly because of the, um, um, the number of British deaths, and, and, and some of them were, sort of, were actually torn to pieces in the street, I think three of the British soldiers. It was, it was uh, brutal. Um, um, and of course it was slightly, uh, People tend to remember that the, 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 the reoccupation, uh, sorry, to explain, the crater was held for about a week, it was in the hands of the NLF, which had pre actually pre previously been a fossil that, that at least they claimed was in their hands. And then until the Cameronians, led by Mad Mitch, of course, in rather flamboyant operation, uh, reasserted the control. Oh, sorry? The oh, Algarve, sorry, the Algarve, the Algarve, the Algarve, the Algarve, the the, what this showed the NLF was, it could no longer be a life bomb, which clearly had you know, become unreliable. This was their assessment, uh, that their, their, their penetration of it uh, was working out. Um, but it was also this coincided with, with the British evacuation of its forces from pull, pulling out of the, of the various protectorates. And so it gave the NLF the, the opportunity um, to simply take on the Emirates, and they captured them one by one, starting in the uh, west and were going to, to the east. And by September uh, 1967, they had taken all of the uh, Emirates, uh, apart from Upper Yaffa, which, um, <laughs> well, that, 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 um, that, that um, uh, treaty I showed you in the early, 1954, because the Upper Yaffa has never realized they're part of South Arabia, <laughs> let alone uh, South Yemen. Um, it was one bit of, of Yemen, uh, uh, which actually remained independent for four months after independence. Um, I mean, independent of the independent uh, government. Uh, but it, 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 uh, uh, the taking of those um, uh, protectors meant that they could then bring in uh, fighters and arms into a, for what was essentially a final confrontation uh, with Fossey and the Porth, which took place in, in, in the autumn of 1967. Again, brutal. Street fighting in 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 Aden, uh, uh, which the uh, uh, NLF eventually won. Um, on the seventh of November, the FRA, was by this time the South Arabian Army, uh, declared it would support the NLF, uh, and allowing its Fossi officers, who had quite a few, inside, many from Aulikis, uh, to go back to their uh, uh, to, to, to their homeland. And then the British used their contacts in the AFR to ask the NLF to start to approach it to, to negotiate. Uh, and because it always happened in a very, very short order. Uh, the negotiation started uh, in 21 November in Geneva, uh, and the People's Democratic Republic was set up um, nine days later um, in, in, a, in a great, uh, great rush. And at Geneva, I think the British uh, were surprised how many people <laughs> From, the, um, from, from, from their friends who were on the other side. Uh, in fact, I think John Shipman's uh, assistant in, in the colour uh, uh, was part of the other left and delegation. Uh, um, that's, this is where Humphrey Tremellon described it. Um, we left without glory but without disaster. And that's the that's a picture from Paddy Nasser Mohammed. President South Yemen, one of his, I don't know where he got it from, this picture he has from the, uh, the, 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 the last day. Um, and there you have it, see, if you look at that photograph on the, on the left, um, these two here were both, both became presidents of, the, of South Yemen. That's one of them here, and the other. Abdul Fattah Ismail was the leader of the uh, uh, in, in Aden, and Ali Antar, who was Minister of Defence and Commander Chief was the leader of the um, uh, of the Mad Fan uh, campaign. Um, so they went from this to, to that. But just to, just to, as is quite a lot of violence involved in this, I should just explain that in PDLY, these three ganged up on him, and he was, uh, uh, as President, was tried and executed in 1978. These two then, ganged up on him, who was his, the next president, he, he was exiled to Moscow, uh, but came back to join him, who they conspired against him, and then in, 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 in January 13, 1986, his guards killed this one, and this chap was later killed. Uh, 
Adidas it still survives, uh, but um, it, it, it does, I can say, illustrate the point you come to power by, by violence, you often end up by the same way. And then, that's just a, a, a final summary, really. Um, that the, the man were there at the right time, they had the right, an appropriate organisation, it turned out. Their focus on the armed struggle was clearly uh, a winning strategy, uh, um, despite uh, the, the, the mayhem. Um, and the protectors did prove to be the route to Aden, not, not the defence of Aden. Um, they had the safe base and Egyptian support, which was absolutely essential for any guerrilla operation. But the British were ready to go. Uh, that was the other great thing. Um, and the Federation was set up too, too late and it was too weak. Flossie failed to really um, create a, an organisation outside Aden and the crucial backing of the, of the army. Uh, which uh, we had created, um, um, uh, proved important. So it's timing, opportunity, and a lot of luck. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Mm -hmm. um, sorry about the microphones. I don't know what's going on with them today, but um, any questions for Noel, please? Yes. Oh, yeah, with this. <laughs> yeah, uh, looking at the last list that, that you, you're giving us, I think there's a critical element missing, and mm -hmm. that's ideology. Um, because uh, I'm doing most of my own research. Yeah, I know, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you sort of see that the Arab nationalists and later the NLF also used the language that really resonated with what people of young age. I mean, if you look at who was behind the NLF, they were all very young, yes. uh, ed pretty educated individuals yeah. that were expecting modernity, a better life, a better system of governance, if you like. Um, by contrast, Flossie and, and Nasserism did not provide this sort of blueprint of how to do a revolution, how to deal with colonialism. And so the NLF resorted to Marxism, even Maoism, in, in some parts. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, our friend John Shipman has given me a Mao's Red Book uh, in Arabic, which he got from uh, one of the Ratfani, uh, sorry, one of the Dofari records. So, you know, I don't know how much they could understand of Mao's Red Book if they read it in the trenches or in the caves. Well, I just, fun, but yeah, it, I remember that was there. Yeah, Mohammed Ali Ahmed, who was the a leading figure in the PR, and he told me he joined the NLF to fight the Sultan of Loda. And he didn't know he was a communist until he went to the first uh, 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 meeting after independence and found he was a Marxist. But he, he simply joined to, to... So there was that element too, I think. It was, it was, yeah, but certainly, absolutely. If you look at who was joining the uh, NLF in, in, in Aden, you can see who they were. School teachers, Ali, Ali Nas Mohammed. Uh, people I showed you, Ali Nas Mohammed was a school teacher. Abdul Ismail was an apprentice in the refinery. Salman Rabar Ali, I think, was arrested by Stephen Day um, um, when he was working for the Sultan of Fadli. I think that's right. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and Ali Antab, you know, yes. Ali Antab, had, he, he was uneducated, but he was the other side of it. Yeah. Um, it's a related question. It seems that um, Flossie tried, or was, was basically after changing with the um, change of people at the top and keeping roughly the same yeah. philosophy, whereas um, the spouse pointed out and got that. Um, was there any uh, sign of Soviet <coughs> influence? Because this is actually very um, similar, both in time and in particular the corporate approach to it, to what happened in Cuba. I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I think the Soviets were interested. In fact, I, I asked a Soviet diplomat this in 1970, and I was there. Someone I'd met previously and was teaching at the party school. And he said, we don't know who these people are. I mean, we are, um, this is an experiment. They say they're Marxists, they're communists. We're going to help them. We're setting up party, party schools to try and educate them. But um, as far as we're concerned, it's an experiment. We don't know. Um, and he claimed that there had been, they knew nothing. There's certainly no evidence of any, anything, anything significant, at least. I mean, not, there probably would have been, because it was the way that you know, the, the Cold War was going at the time, there would have been some attempt, but there's, there's no evidence of, of it, or indeed Maoism. 
at the time. Mm -hmm. It all came afterwards. Um, could I follow on from those two questions? Because uh, first, a declaration of interest. I was Shell's district sales manager in right. yeah, 64, 67. Um, but Namkin, in his book, mm. Great Wars of Yemen, mm. makes considerable pay of the Russian influence politically on the MLF, which is well, I think what we're, we're trying yes. to score that ideological yep. and political influence. Not for the arms and so on, that came from the Egyptians, and uh, we know that. But what about this? Um, I was, yes, I, yes, I, I, well, was Namkin really just putting a Russian spin on it all? I don't, I don't, I've, read his book, I've talked to Namkin about this. And you get the, I, I got the impression from, from him, it's, it's largely afterwards. There was certainly, he, he was obviously in contact with them, so there was, yeah. was, some, was co some contact there, but, but nothing beyond that. The, um, uh, they were reading Marxism, but the, the, the attempt to teach Marxism, etc., came, came in uh, really after. after, after. I'm sorry, into that, my own mm. experience of it. Mm. I mean, we used to joke, um, we knew about MLF long before government did, obviously, because uh, we used to joke our senior staff were Flossy and our um, yes. junior staff were MLF, and we knew that from 65. But the uh, point was that um, uh, they were also very secular. Yes. And I think that is something which is not, one's not aware of, you know, one had a secular state for 22 years in the oh. Yeah. And they, MLF, were, were Marxists, I think, in ideology, and they were very secular. And yes. it was yes. very interesting that that could be successful. And how could that be successful in a very traditional society? Well, I think it was the, the whole Arab world was secular at the time. All the revolutions yes, exactly. were Marxist, uh, NASA. I mean, uh, and the NLF, when it set up, it, it really, certainly initially, it, it simply it didn't quite repress. It recognised Islam as the, um, uh, uh, the official religion, but it did nothing uh, uh, to, su to su support Islam in the day, uh, early days. And there was some destruction of, uh, of sh shrines in, 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 in Hadramaut. Uh, but later on, it, 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 it became, um, uh, once uh, it, 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 you saw photographs that in left, he was praying at mosques on Friday. Well, I was there, it started, well, I was there. Um, and then later on, they developed this, uh, the theories of you know, revolution, um, uh, revolutionary ideology to find the, you know, the Islamic writers in the past, the, 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 throughout history, that the Britain in favor of, of, of revolution. And so they, they encouraged the, the study of that form, of Marxism, of that, that school. But yes, but it was, I think, simply a secular, it, the 1950s, 60s, and 70s were secular. I mean, it's extraordinary now, because you know, it's, it's really since the 1970s, it's gone back the other way. But, uh, these were secular days. Yeah. Uh, yes. um, I just the first president was um, Akhtar Hamid Shah. Yeah. And they, he, he was from the NLF. Yeah. And they turned against him and they imprisoned mm. him. Was that, I mean, I don't know what reason, I, I was young at that time, I just want to think about it. Um, I'm thinking, I mean, is that because he, he was against the uh, communists? Against the, uh, the ideology of the, uh, the influence of the Russian uh, the, at that time, uh, because well, the people who came after that was the other, yeah. where they were very really influenced by the, um, the by the Russian. Uh, yeah. So is that? Well, I think it's good. I, think probably, I mentioned the divisions in the 65, that's where it started. So you saw when part of the NLF, uh, particularly by those radical leaders, uh, that's Kahtan Ashadi. Kahtan was from a different generation. He was sort of 20 years older than most of the others. The, the, the people we're talking about were in the 20s and 30s, uh, uh, late 20s, early 30s, um, whilst this was going on. Um, he was an older generation. I think his fundamental approach was we should take what we've inherited in PDRY uh, and make it work. Because yeah, bearing in mind that, that the uh, uh, um, Aden port had been really decimated by the closure of the Suez Canal in 1967, so the PDRY inherited a very, very poor economy. Um, um, and, the, and he's ambivalent. There was a coup, almost a coup, in, in three months after independence of the army. Um, it, tried to take part. It was a sort of funny coup. They sort of marched up to the um, to, to the presidency, so to speak, but stopped. 
and you can go inside, uh, but try to, 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 to negotiate. And I think the feeling was that, that Kaftan Shabi had done a deal with them. Um, and he purged the left wing, tried to purge the left wing then, and it was that, that, that he couldn't do it successfully because it was just too strong. And they came back in 1969 and they overthrew him. So, but the origins of that, I suppose, go back to the split in 1965, where you saw the NLF moving in a much more Marxist uh, uh, direction. Uh, and that was largely inspired, I mean, apart from the Soviet, it was actually largely inspired by the, the similar moves within the um, uh, movement of Arab nationalists, particularly Nari Kawakma. He was the influence moving towards, uh, towards Marxism. Um, so it's, it's, it, happened, it happened throughout the, 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 the party at the time. Well, I just had a comment or a word on the Russians in mm. 65, a Russian aeroplane carrying arms and gold ah. for the uh, revolution to the um, Republicans, mm. which was captured by the royalists who burnt the plane, bundled up four Russians and sent them over the border, and I was asked to look after them and keep them out of the way so the government could decide what on earth to do with them. I became very chummy. One of them was a diplomat from the embassy. Huh. And the first thing was his complete ignorance of what was going on in the South. Mm. He had absolutely no idea, what, nor any interest in it, actually, either. And I took him all over the territory, but, and I was trying to grill him on that. Were you actually, are you actually involved in anything down here? And the very firm answer was not in the slightest. Yeah. All got to do is get out of this ghastly place. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank uh, no, very much indeed for, for uh, addressing us, and uh, uh, maybe people would show their uh, thanks in the normal manner. <laughs>